time. And it's my honor and privilege to introduce my teacher, Dr. Brian Estell, um, to us right now. And he's going to come to speak God's word, minister God's word to us. Yeah. Well, good morning. It's a uh, pleasure to be with you. I bring you greetings from the saints. We heard about the communion of the saints earlier. And uh, we do knit our hearts together with Christians all around the globe. But I, I bring you greetings from my local church, Escondido OPC. And um, it's good to be uh, with you uh, this morning. If you would, um, turn in your Bibles to Psalms 1 and 2. You're welcome to just listen also, uh, but I'll be reading from the ESV, Psalms 1 and 2. This is God's very word. Let us give careful attention to it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away, and therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, and I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's the reading of God's word. If you'll indulge me and the elders will, let us uh, ask the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts as we turn to his word. Father, we pray now as we turn to your word and understanding of it, that you would wipe away all distractions, that you would give us uh, the attentiveness that is due to your word and grant us that posture without which no one can understand truth, especially from your scripture. Namely, that we might have reverence and humility before it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In practice, over the centuries, the Jewish community has always considered learning to be a sweet thing. Some of this they probably took from Proverbs 22.6 which says, and I quote, train, the Hebrew word chanoch, a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Close quote. In modern Hebrew, you can hear similar words built on the same root. We see something similar. For education is called chinuch, and an educator is called machanech. Now, through the centuries, the Jewish community has understood this word to
to be linked with the meaning having to rub the palate or the gums. Some have thought this came from the Arab practice of rubbing date juice on the gums of infants. One scholar suggests that this was the original meaning. Calvin, even in the 16th century, recognizes that the Jews did this in their own way by rubbing apple honey on the gums of their babies. This use of honey in Jewish education can be seen in a very practical tip, uh, practice, typical of the first school day when children uh, go to school. The student is shown a chalkboard, a small one that they can take in their lap, and then two scriptures are written on the chalkboard in chalk, Leviticus 1.1 and Deuteronomy 33.4, and then one further sentence that says, the law will be my calling. And then the teacher would read the passage uh, off the chalkboard, and uh, honey would be rubbed on the chalkboard, and then the student would actually lick the honey off the chalkboard, if you can imagine that, kids. And this would recall, uh, you'll remember from early on in Ezekiel 3.3, chapter 3.3, when Ezekiel said, quote, I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, close quote. The rabbis obviously wanted learning to be considered something sweet and precious, especially when it came to divine truth. Now, some of you may be wondering why two psalms this morning and not just one. Basically, because I want you to consider one very important question, and that is, how can I grow closer to God? What's the quickest pathway to know God, to love him, to learn to love him even more than you do? And the answer simply stated is study and prayer. Let me explain. It used to be, perhaps, perhaps even probably, that Psalm 2 was the beginning of your Psalter. In other words, the Psalter is all the Psalms within the collection of Psalms, Psalm 1 through uh, 150. Just one piece of evidence, I could cite others, but we won't take time to do so, comes from a very important manuscript in Acts chapter 13, 33, uh, that actually says, in the first psalm. And the first psalm, as it's related there, is actually Psalm 2, not Psalm 1. Now, this is interesting because it raises a question, why not Psalm 1? Well, probably the very last people to put together our Psalter, which in the ancient world was kind of like our Trinity hymnal for the Jews who sang unto God, was that Psalm 1 would be a kind of preamble to the entire Psalter, that it would introduce all the Psalms and therefore was the last one probably put there to frame how we think about the Psalter. Now, this raises another question. What did our ancient believing forefathers consider the highway to God, the most sure path to know and to love our Savior? Was it study or was it prayer? Or stated another way from a more rabbinic perspective, does God's revelation come through study, as Psalm 1 would suggest, or worship of the king, as Psalm 2 would suggest? In other words, Worship of the king in public acts of prayer and piety. For as important as prayer is in the Psalter, and there are many beautiful individual prayers represented there, um, Psalm 1, serving as a kind of framing technique for the entire Psalter, is not a prayer. If you look at Psalm 1 closely, you'll see that God's name, or at least uh, an approach to God in prayer is not even mentioned. Now, this is not to deny that there are many beautiful individual prayers in Psalm 1 and throughout, or in the Psalter and throughout the Psalter, but it does raise an interesting question. What's the quickest, most sure pathway to God to know him, to love him, and to treasure him? 
So first of all, we'll look at Psalm 1, then we'll look at Psalm 2. And in Psalm 1, I want to draw out, first of all, uh, if you follow along in your Bible, the two ways. Uh, this is a doctrine that's taught in Psalm 1 and permeates throughout the Bible. There's two paths to God. And then I want to look at the two kinds of people that are described in Psalm 1. You will see that it is both the righteous and the wicked that are described and then we want to look at the paradigmatic person who is described in Psalm 1. In other words, kids, what I mean by that is there's an individual described in Psalm 1 um, who transcends any possibility of a mere human doing what Psalm 1 describes. So first of all, the two ways. Right on the surface of the psalm, there's a clear setting forth of two paths before human beings. This is easily contrasted in the content of verses 1 to 3 and in verses 4 to 5. God knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And here, right at the beginning of Psalm 1 in verse 2, the medium of revelation of God disclosing himself to human beings, the highest path to God is meditation upon God's Torah. Now, what is the psalmist referring to here when he uses the word Torah? This question is difficult to answer definitively because we don't know the final date of Psalm 1. Could it be the Pentateuch kids, the first five books of the Bible? Could it be um, some other book? Could it be the canon? of scripture that uh, was in existence at the time that the psalmist wrote the psalm? Could it be the book of Deuteronomy? Uh, we don't know for sure, but the important point here is that we cannot reduce this reference to Torah to mean merely law. It means much more than law. Rather, it means God's merciful instruction to his people from many various parts of God's scripture. This is the living speech of God, as indicated. We earlier read a portion of Psalm 119. I was a little worried, by the way, Sangwu introduced it, that he was going to launch into the entirety of Psalm 119. But it's reviving Psalm 197. And God's word or Torah is cheering to the heart. It has a cheering uh, power about it. Um, it radiates light and brightness. Psalm 119, 105, and 130. These are the experiences of the revelation of God as people meditate upon God's word, as they take delight and enjoyment in it through the soft murmuring, even out loud, the word would indicate in Psalm 1 of God's word to ourselves. So perhaps meditation is the best way to translate Psalm 1 too. But just as there are two kinds of paths described, it's very easy to see from God's word there's two kinds of people described. Here in Psalm 1, we have the righteous, the zedekim, and then contrasted with the righteous are the wicked, the rashaim. The righteous person has his delight in God's law and God's Torah and God's instruction. He meditates upon it day and night. He is truly a fortunate person who chooses the way that brings blessing as opposed to the way that brings destruction. Because the way of the wicked will bring about destruction. His path is described as chaff, which when they threw wheat up in the air and the wind would blow through the barn, the lighter aspects of that which did not fall to the ground are the chaff. And the wicked is described like unto that. There's a black and white contrast here between the righteous. The righteous have life by meditating on God's law. They have peaceful solitude, whereas the life of the wicked is described as having a character of the mass of the lost, those people who drift away. That is the outcome of the life of the wicked, but then notice verse 5, it raises another important question about the meaning of the wicked standing in the judgment or not being able to stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation 
of the righteous. Now, what does this mean? Well, the wicked have also been found guilty before the Torah of God. So in contrast to the truly happy life, prosperous life, bountiful life, peaceful solitude of the righteous, uh, we have the wicked described. They're, they flee from the direction of God and the path of God, and they're excluded from the place where Torah is expounded. So one thinks of Psalm 15, quote, O Lord, who shall so sojourn uh, in your tent, and who may dwell on your holy hill? Close quote. You see, friends, the wicked hate Torah instruction at the end of the day. Isn't this what we see in our own culture? Sure, we're not like unto some of the missionaries who have been mentioned. I just returned from our General Assembly where we play, prayed for many of our missionaries, some who are ministering in countries I cannot mention publicly, uh, and that would surprise you. There they are hated. There they are thrown in prison. There for 15 years, brothers and sisters in Eritrea have been thrown and kept in prison. South Sudan, the same. Haiti, we cannot even send missionaries back to Haiti because of the danger and the thugs who roam on the streets and will attack all kinds of people, especially Christians. You see, they are the ones, the wicked, who are removed from the worship of God as Psalms 4, uh, chapter, uh, rather, Psalm 5, verse 4 or 5, just a little bit later, says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. No, you hate all evil doers. So here we see that though Christians are often hated, either by innuendo or more blatantly, or perhaps persecuted, perhaps killed for their faith, at the end of the day, it is God who will make a separation between the righteous and the wicked. The only laughing matter here is the wicked, as God derides them at the end of the day. They shall not stand before your eyes. So having seen the two ways, having very clearly set before us the two kinds of people, the Zadikim, the righteous, and then also the Rashaim, the wicked, now we see the paradigmatic person described implicitly in this psalm. You see the stark contrast between the lifestyle of the righteous and the lifestyle of those who meditate on Torah in contrast to those who live directionalist lives, the lost mass of humanity outside even the doors of this church. But there we see the righteous described. And everything spoken in Psalm 1 about the righteous entails a character that transcends any one individual. As one author has said, they are expressions and they definitely transcend human, psychological, and moral possibilities. You see, this picture in Psalm 1 is of the super individual, the paradigmatic person, the model, if you will, kids. Even the most righteous Pharisee, with his rigorous attention to obeying all the facets of God's law personally, perpetually, perfectly, falls short of what is described in this psalm. No, what is described in this part, psalm is the ultimate paradigmatic person, our Savior, Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, whom God made our righteousness. He's the fulfillment of this Old Testament picture. Jesus declared to his disciples when they urged him to eat something, quote, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, John 4.34. Therefore, Christian, you may recognize that in the congregation of that God of the new covenant, you may recognize and experience a joyful, lifelong relationship to God in and through his Torah, that is, his scripture, which was founded upon a life-imparting, life-bestowing power of God through Jesus Christ, especially as you draw near to him and you are clothed in his righteousness. In the future, in the present, it is in and through him that is Christ that you too may participate in this ever-fortunate, 
blessed manner of life and existence as a new creature, the perfectly righteous one, namely Jesus Christ. On to Psalm 2. What a great piece of poetry. The central thought of the psalm is the worldwide dominion of the king of Zion, the Davidic king and the firstborn son of God, the highest among the kings of the earth. Psalm 2 is one of the psalms most frequently quoted in the New Testament. From the perspective of early Christianity, it was a messianic psalm par excellence. We'll divide it into four strophes. A strophe, kids, is just a batch of poetry, a section, and here we can see four batches. First of all, notice the confederacy of the nations, verses 1 to 3. In verses 1 to 2, the poet describes the mustering of a great revolt, the nations eager to cast off allegiance to the ideal king. And notice the opening question, why do the nations rage? It sets the tone uh, for the whole uh, psalm that follows, the incredulity of the narrator. How can the nations rage against God and cast off his rule? Verse 3 continues with a representative, bombastic statements. How is this rebellion interpreted by our forefathers, the early Christians at the time immediately following the ascension of Christ? Well, in Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 28, listen carefully. We read, on their release, and I quote, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer and said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. Do you hear, people of God, how the early Christians interpreted Psalm 2? The earliest of Christians saw the rebellion of the nations, the torture and torment and crucifixion ultimately of our Lord as a fulfillment of Psalm 2, the opposition to Jesus by Herod Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and some in Israel. And then we move on to the second strophe, which begins at verse 4 and goes through verse 6, where God mocks their puny efforts. Notice the contrast between God enthroned earlier on, and then he who sits in the heavens, vis-a-vis -vis what we just read about the rebellious rulers bombastically taking their stand. In other words, the only laughing matter, as I mentioned here, is the arrogance of the wicked in God's eyes. And then we come to verse 6, where the subject I is put right up front of the poem, of the line, in order to emphasize who it is who is speaking. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. In short, heaven triumphs over the arrogant and the proud. Those who exalt themselves will be abased. God confounds the wise. No wonder the apostle Paul would later say, 1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Or again in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Closed quote. You see, this kingdom will come in full power in the future when there will be one kingdom and God will rule over all. But now we wait patiently. But nevertheless, this kingdom has been inaugurated and we are evidence of this as we draw together as brothers and sisters in the new covenant and worship the king. It's like a rooster. Satan rages like a rooster. 
What happens when you cut off the head of a rooster? He runs around. But what is sure to happen as he runs around? Because he's bleeding out, and he will bleed out. Eventually, he flops over and dies. So, too, the kingdom has been inaugurated. So, too, it will be consummated. And then we move on to the third strophe, the divine decree in verses 7 to 9. And here we see and hear the divine decree. But what is the decree referring to? Well, many scholars see this decree referring to a kind of hyperbolic language that they used in the ancient Near East. When kings would exaggerate their power and their dominion, and we see this inscriptions and statutes and pediments all over the ancient world. But alas, I don't think that's the right interpretation. This decree is a prophecy that connects back with the Davidic covenant. You remember those words when Nathan came to David? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14 and following. When your days are over, David, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come, one who will come from your own body. And I will establish his kingdom, and he is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be his father, and he will be my son. You see, the I tell, I will recount to you now the decree is probably a formula that happened at one time in a coronation, but nevertheless is now used to refer to the coronation rites, the crowning of the King of Kings, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. But the full value of this, the homecoming of this Psalm 2, we see the full value, the homecoming of it really in the writer to Hebrews. I refresh your memory. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, where it records for us, for which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. No, even as great and scary as angels were to encounter, there is no one like the son who far exceeds as creator, all his creation, even the creatures of God, the angels. That's the writer to Hebrews' point. Our Lord Jesus in his post-resurrection appearances makes an application of the Psalms by this Psalm by charging his disciples to spread the gospel to the nations, to the ends of the earth, which leads us back to the final strophe in Psalm 2. This is practical lessons in verses 10 through 12, the fourth strophe. Now in verses 10 to 12, the final appeal goes out to the nations. Be instructed. Be warned, you kings, you presidents of worldly powers. Verse 11 has proved troublesome to interpreters for centuries. Perhaps it should be rendered, rejoice with trembling, which is not too difficult to understand if one were to think that it is only appropriate mixture of emotion in the face of a great king so great and awesome. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry. And the word for son there is not Hebrew, though the rest of the psalm is. The word for son there is actually bar, like Barnabas, son of encouragement. Not Ben, like Ben David, son of David. Now that raises an interesting question. Why would the psalm record in Aramaic to these foreign rulers and nations that they ought to kiss the son, the bar? Well, because it's the pagan nations that God is addressing. And their language at the time, just like the primary language here is English, their primary language at the time was Aramaic. So God appeals to them in Aramaic. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Same kind of thing happened with Jesus on the cross when he is raised up with that horrible cry of dereliction, the old English word for abandonment. The cry of abandonment that he uttered in one of his seven sayings on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Now there's a Hebraized Aramaic form. Why? Aramaic on the cross? At his utmost point of suffering? So it would resonate with the people who were onlooking. 
people whose language was Aramaic at the time. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry. One thing you may uh, see here is that he's drawing our thoughts to the appeal uh, to the nations that they may be reconciled with God while there is still time to do so. Finally, a few points of application and conclusion. Yes, up the road at the institution where your pastor was trained and saying, we really do believe in application. First, it should be evident that the deliberate placement of Psalm 1 is a preamble, a framing technique to read the entire Psalter, which, by the way, Luther called it a mini Bible. Well, I wanted to preach all the scriptures to you today, so we'll preach from the Psalm, Psalm 1 and 2. First, you should notice that Psalm 1 as a preamble to the Psalter teaches us that the editors of the Psalter, God himself, transformed a collection of mostly individual psalms of prayer into a collection that is intellectual. That is, there should be no false dichotomy between study, instruction, and prayer. Ultimately, it seems as though the Psalter was happy to let this tension reside. Study or public acts of piety and prayer, they never resolve this because both paths are a sure path to God. Both are a sure way to know your Savior. As Craig Troxell, my colleague, has said in a recent book, quote, our call is nothing short of loving the Lord our God with all our minds, Our thinking is closely related to the other chambers of our heart. Head and heart, they go hand in hand. There is an integral and close relationship between the mind and the heart. And therefore, as you think about devoting yourself in this next season to growing closer with God, who does not want to grow closer with God, then meditating upon his word, edifying reading, Uh, perhaps even meditating on his word out loud, you will be doing something that is very good for your soul, that is very edifying and uplifting. You will be carving out a pathway to God. That's the first point. The second is we've seen the strand of supernatural otherworldliness in Psalm 2 that God has set before us. David and all subsequent Davidic kings never exercised such worldwide dominion as is expressed in Psalm 2. It was left to the true son of David, that is Christ, to bring in the gospel of the highest good, the ultimate satisfaction, where true liberty of our souls from tyranny of the devil, from sin that weighs us down and is a hard yoke, Jesus has given us that true Christian liberty as our confession in chapter 20 so beautifully describes. So as you look to the future, praise be to God who has fulfilled your deepest desires and longings with a gospel message of abiding significance and abiding power. It's missionary week. I can stand up here and give you a Exposition of the first part of Isaiah 6, where he's drawn in before the throne of God. You remember, and Isaiah is so smitten, touches his lips with coals, here I am, send me. And I could yell at you, who will go? (laughs) But you know, that's not God's way. What God wants to do is so overwhelm you with his august majesty of what he has accomplished through the grace of Jesus Christ, that you cannot help but want to serve him freely, willingly, which doesn't necessarily mean that you are called to go to some foreign nation. But surely, as is mentioned this morning, we're all called to pray for those that we send abroad or send even into harm's way or give our checks 
and our money so that indeed they may be encouraged as they spread the gospel of those who do not know. But that comes through an exposition of the august majesty of God, not by guilt tripping people. Oh, the seed of the serpent still rages against the seed of the woman, even though Christ has inaugurated his kingdom. But the climax of his dominion still remains a future reality. However, it is already an accomplished reality. And even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In closing, perhaps nothing could be more edifying than to turn to the revelation of John, where Psalm 2 is echoed time and time again. Hear now the word of God through John in the revelation. Chapter 1, verse 5. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Revelation 2, 26, 27. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter and he will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. Revelation 4, verse 2. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Revelation 6, verse 16 to 17. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Fathers and brothers, sisters and children, in light of these truths, we should worship God and praise him for the salvation he has brought and the salvation he is bringing about for you and many others. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, uh, Lord, for what it reminds us of as the quickest and surest path to you. You honor and dignify us by making us at the apex of all your creatures and having an intellectual ability to know you. And you have graciously accommodated to us to speak to us in words that we can understand and know what you have done. And you give us more than the light of nature. In fact, you have revealed to us, O oh Lord, your way of salvation. And for that, we give you great praise and honor. Father, we also thank you that you have created a way to pray to you. Indeed, even now, we have a high priest, an elder brother, who petitions you before the throne. Indeed, your spirit even helps us in our weakness to know how to pray. Oh, Father, you are so good. Your mercy is manifest. Father, but we do long to see all the nations come in. Pity the nations, we do pray. Bring all your elect in, O oh Lord. And even through us, in our testimony before our neighbors and before the watching world, and even through our missionaries and our officers in the church as they make your word known. Oh, Father, help us to that end. And as you grant success, we will be very careful to make sure that the glory redounds to your dear son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.